There's, there's people I, I know from Minnesota, Illinois, Tennessee, Texas, out in California. You know, they got to get their story out there because uh, to remain silent basically is to show consent. And, and as I mentioned before, that if you are looking at an issue that you need to learn to speak up, uh, because if you don't, nobody else will. And something that might be said of, of out of you know this 11 or 12 people that have been spoken, that have uh, given their story today, will encourage somebody else to come forward. And like I said, you've got a movement going here, Bill, and, and I'm very impressed. My name is Marty Pren. I'm from Seckler Shores, Michigan, and the issue that I want to talk about is elder and guardianship abuse. My mother was an 87-year-old woman who visited out in Colorado Springs, and uh, I allowed her to visit with my sister, and through fraud and a fraudulent uh, power of attorney, she was able to uh, attempt to undo a trust that was set up back in 1998, where she was protected under a Michigan trust, and the courts in Colorado had taken and usurped their authority in the fact that they did not have jurisdiction over my mother because she was a resident of Michigan. The uh, court continued to ignore documents that I had provided for them, and they allowed me only the ability to be able to have a phone conference where in Colorado they would have had ex parte communication with my brother and sisters, and uh, the court administrator was actually a friend of the judge, and as I reviewed everything that was going on, they had totally ignored my mother's first, fourth, and fourteenth amendment rights in the fact that she was not protected under the terms of the trust. And the issue that came into play is that I challenged the forged power of attorney in the fact that I knew my mother was not of sound mind and that she had advanced dementia and Alzheimer's and yet this was totally ignored by the court and they allowed or they actually took the uh, power of attorney that my sister had knowing it was fraudulent but took mine from Michigan and suspended it and then basically took their Colorado laws and tried to apply it to my mother who was not a resident under their own laws of being a resident for six months there and the issue that came into play is that they had a uh, signed document from a visitor's report stating my mother was authorizing them to take all of the attorney fees and all of the cost of the guardianship that should have never happened and have it taken out of my dad's trust, which even if my mom was of sound mind, would not have been able to do because I was the successor trustee for the trust. And through a series of uh, court proceedings, uh, they granted the uh, court, uh, a court uh, conservator and ended up having a guardian where they had uh, uh, basically pilfered uh, my mother's estate. Give me a little bit of family background. Well, uh, there was uh, six children. Uh, I had three brothers and two sisters. I'm the fifth of the six kids. I was the only one living in Michigan, and I had been the primary caregiver for both my mom and dad for the last 12 years. And we designed a trust back in 1998 to protect my parents' interests so that long term they would be protected to have uh, care for them. Uh, and then afterwards, whatever might have been left would have been left in the way of an inheritance for the children through a will. Um, but uh, through a series of uh, uh, determinations out in Colorado for a court that technically had no jurisdiction. Uh, they totally ignored my mom's will and uh, the home that I was living in, uh, which was my mother's, was to go to me in her will free and clear. Properties were to be sold and uh, my brother ignored the, the terms of the will. The judge out in Colorado determined that there was no will even though there was. My mother was domiciled and was a resident of Michigan and, uh, like I said, through a series of uh, court decisions, uh, I have now been left homeless uh, in Michigan as a result of their, their actions. Um, so how in the world did 
judge claim that they had, if your mother was domiciled here, did they try to claim she was domiciled there? No, nope, there was no issue of trying to be domiciled. They just said, in fact, the judge, because I had brought up so many issues and challenged her and told her, you know, that, that she has no jurisdiction over me because I'm in Michigan. She tried to hold me in contempt. And I said, good luck, because your, your authority as a judicial branch of government is limited to Colorado. You have no authority in Michigan. And the fact that uh, under Colorado statute, my mother would have had to have lived in Colorado for six months in order to be de determined to be a resident. And again, these were all things that they ignored. Once they had this uh, fraudulent, durable power of attorney, they took my name off of a joint account that I had with my mother here in Michigan that had $14,000 of my money. And basically, the court was involved in what I believe was a conspiracy to defraud my father's trust that was set up to, and designed to protect my mom. And uh, there was two attorneys here in Michigan and four out in Colorado. And with all the proceedings and paperwork that they shuffled back and forth, they ran up over $200,000 in billable hours. And then uh, I, being my mom's personal representative, I wasn't even allowed to go to her funeral, which she had passed away. And I believe in my whole heart that my sister, uh, using hospice, starved my mom to death because she had uh, wanted to move on with her life, wanted to divorce her husband, and move on to be with her new boyfriend. I've asked, uh, started from the local police, to the state police, to the Michigan Attorney General, to the Colorado Attorney General, to the FBI, and to the Justice Department. And I talked with uh, both the uh, head of the FBI in Detroit and the uh, Barb McQuaid, the uh, Assistant U.S. Attorney, and uh, they all said they couldn't do anything because it wasn't in their jurisdiction. But if you look at their website uh, and understand when there's a forged document, that is the FBI's jurisdiction. A state, uh, local police can't do anything with it. And uh, there's just a whole attitude that um, the elderly, once they reach 60 or 65, are expendable. And the government doesn't want to spend any money on, on going after any of the criminals. And uh, they basically take the hospice avenue uh, as a way to terminate these people. And uh, I, I believe the decline of America started back when Terry Schiavo was allowed to uh, be pulled off the feeding tube uh, because her husband at the time wanted to get a divorce and the Supreme Court ultimately ruled that uh, her uh, strange husband had the authority to pull the plug. And it's just become too easy to uh, terminate the life of the elderly, and uh, nobody uh, up until this point that I've seen is willing to go forward and really speak about it, and if I have to go national with the issue of what happened to my mother in order to help other people, I'm willing to do that. There's a trust for your dad. Correct. And there's a will, will for your mom, mm -hmm. and no trust for your mom. Well, we, we specifically designed it that way because uh, ours was one of these dysfunctional families that the kids would manipulate mom and when we were younger growing up you know the other kids knew how to manipulate mom and they play mom and dad against each other and we knew that mom was not of sound mind because she had a series of mini strokes or TIAs and uh, so when we talked to the attorney we set it up that uh, my, it was my father's trust and my mom was a marital benefactor but that I was the designated uh, successor trustee to the trust as well as being the personal representative for each of the parents and being the uh, uh, health care uh, representative. And through a series of uh, shenanigans, I'll say that my sister pulled, that she first went to the Social Security uh, Administration to get uh, designated as a representative payee, even though my mother's Social Security checks had been direct deposited into an account in Michigan. and. Uh, I found documents that my sister had where uh, even when she was in high school she had forged my mom's signature in order to get what she wants. And, and uh, there's dynamics of families that I don't think the court even takes into consideration and when somebody applies for an emergency guardianship they're going based off of the fact of just what this one person's saying. And I was involved in an issue that had to do with Lake Access in Michigan and there is a Supreme Court ruling in Michigan that's published so it's, it's a binding presidential uh, or a president setting uh, court case that states if you have a written agreement and it's between two parties even if it's not 
uh, what a court would consider to be fair or legal as long as both parties agree to it. It's a legal and binding uh, issue and the courts are required to look at that document and to rule based on what's written there and not to put their own interpretation or what they think would be in the better interest of somebody. And that's where I believe that, there, that there's a flaw in the system. Uh, I believe the Michigan Attorney General's office with both Mike Cox and Bill Schutte let my mom down because she was a Michigan resident and they should have stepped in and told Colorado, you guys are interfering with a Michigan resident, she needs to come back to Michigan, and the court in Colorado, the probate court, basically became an accessory after the fact of kidnapping my mother because they made a court order saying she could not return to Michigan, that I could not come and visit and uh, see her, and uh, basically interfering with, with my right as, as a child, uh, or even as an adult, uh, to be able to talk with her and uh, they basically ignored written documents that were done when my mom and dad both were of sound mind and uh, basically overstepped their boundaries when it came to uh, looking at what was done to throw out these actual documents where time was taken to put these into play and to come in and then say because I'm a judge I'm going to rule differently than what your parents want and it's interfering with my rights and with my parents rights even though they're both deceased now with what their intent was to distribute the assets. And uh, I know I did give a copy of my mom's will, uh, provided it for you folks, and there's specific language in there that says it, it, there appears to be more given to Marty than the other children, and I'm aware of that, and it's because he had taken care of both me and my husband for an extended period of time, and that we felt it was only fair to compensate him differently than the other children. Not that they didn't love the other children, but uh, as the uh, Bible verse goes, to whom much is given, much is required. And I know <clears throat> that I extended both of my parents' life by giving them the care that they needed individually because neither of them, I mean, they clearly expressed this, neither of them wanted to go into a nursing home. And so I basically, uh, once I left my uh, place of employment, worked full-time providing their care. The, the issue of forgery, uh, my sister took the... Uh, durable power of attorney and forged it, and I know this for several reasons. She had a history of forging my mom's signature in the past, which I do have copies of and provided to the FBI. Plus, there is a neuropsychological evaluation that was done by a trained psychiatrist that said because of my mother's Parkinson-type symptoms, there is no way she could have written anything legibly uh, that, that uh, what was written clearly was not from my mom. And uh, that should have just tossed it right out there, but Again, the judge suspended both of our powers of attorney, which I believe she abused her authority in doing so. But there's a pattern of, of what, it's almost like there's a script that these uh, judges follow. But uh, again, I've got the uh, original documents that, that I want the FBI to look at to verify, because they would have to have their handwriting expert to do so. To summarize, that uh, my parents uh, and myself, because they asked me to, to intervene, uh, because they had uh, belief in my ability to care for them and to do it in such a way that uh, I would be looking out for their best interest. Um, and that was put together in uh, January 19th of uh, 1998. And uh, we put together uh, in such a way that it protected my mom from being manipulated, um, that there was uh, both wills, almost uh, the, the wording in there was almost identical. Uh, and that we had done everything that we were supposed to do to protect their long-term uh, investments and to make sure that there was money there to provide for their long-term care so that they did not have to go into a nursing home because that was one thing that they were both very adamant about. They did not want to go to a nursing home and be isolated from each other. Uh, my, my dad had actually been a German uh, in the German military. My mom was an American nurse. Um, and. They just did not want to be apart from each other. So that uh, uh, we put together the, uh, the, the uh, trust and the will, and, and again, the Colorado courts had no authority to interfere or to take, uh, in fact, the guardian ad litem had even said to the judge, because she asked, that we do not have proper jurisdiction here because there is Michigan trust, and we are defying law by doing so, and the judge says, I don't care 
we're going to go because they have property in Colorado, therefore that gives us jurisdiction. And uh, like I said, the, the long and short of it was my mother and father's uh, uh, wishes were not followed, and I truly believe that my mother as a result of it was, was uh, killed by my sister by starvation using the uh, cover of hospice. And uh, I'm still pursuing to this day having the FBI and the U.S. Justice Department to uh, intervene and to investigate what was being done because there is no statute of limitations on murder. And as I researched this more, I found out it's not just me that this happened to, that this has become actually uh, a national epidemic that the uh, General Accounting Office has said it ha that elder and guardianship abuse is now the number one white-collar crime that involves forgery, embezzlement, perjury, and uh, the government, government needs to step in and they can't just say, you know, we're, we're not going to address this issue. They have an obligation to protect the rights of the elderly. And what happens when we get these guardianship situations or conservatorships, the uh, court-appointed people are raiding the life savings of the elderly and lining their pockets with money and uh, it's to the benefit of the courts and everything else. But again, it's got to get to the point where there's a movie called Network that came out, I believe, in the 1980s, and I think William Holden was in there. And there's a scene where he goes to the uh, news desk, and he starts talking about, we know things are bad out there. They're really bad. But <clears throat> it gets to the point where I'm at that you have to get and he phrased it, you have to rise up, you have to speak up, <clears throat> and you have to become mad as hell and get other people to come on board and realize that <clears throat> not only is it your duty, it's your obligation to challenge the government and say you're wrong when they're wrong and to tell courts that I'm not going to let you walk over me and take your authority to try to bully me. And uh, it's been a long two or three year struggle, but uh, it, it's been a, a very interesting uh, journey that I've been on. And I've met uh, many people who have contacted me through my Facebook page. And uh, I'm proud to say that uh, there was a situation in Macomb County where there was a uh, chiropractor who was uh, another victim elder of elder and guardianship abuse and uh, his children contacted me and we were able to save his life because his wife had tried to poison him and uh, that's still an ongoing issue in the Macomb County area but as we found out more and more that there is so much fraud and corruption that unless you're involved with it directly you could be driving right past it in a car if you will and not even know what's going on because it's so hidden under the uh, color of law under the guise of, you know, uh, just having a probate judge there and the families themselves, they don't allow the media to come in to say what's really going on. And in the case in Colorado, they claimed once the uh, uh, case was closed that it was sealed and it couldn't be open for review. And uh, under the uh, uh, Sunshine Laws in Michigan, and I believe they apply across the country, that there are issues where you have the freedom of information I, as an interested party, have a right to know what testimony was given to the judge before I could even know what was going on. And uh, I'm looking to get uh, some attorney that's a well-versed attorney in probate and elder case law to look at this case on a contingency basis, go after the credit union for taking my name off an account that had no authority to do so, that caused me great financial hardship, and then to go after those that were involved, the officers of the court, knowing full well that they were ignoring and, and violating the law. And uh, it, it's, like I said, become a national epidemic where you have to stand up to the people, and it's no different than uh, having a bully in high school, that, that that person will continue to bully until you say, enough, I'm not going to take it anymore, and you fight back. And uh, it, it, it's just emotionally draining. Um, <clears throat> to not be able to, uh, like I said, attend my own mother's funeral when I was designated to be her personal representative. Uh, and, and it's just like you can't believe that these things 
go on, but yet if you look, and I don't want to get all religious here, but if you look back in the Bible, it goes all the way back to Jacob and Esau where the mother uh, put uh, hair from a lamb on one of the son's arms in order to deceive uh, the father into giving his birthright to one of the other children. It goes back to Joseph where his brothers took him and sold him and made the father believe that, that he was killed all for their inheritance. And uh, <clears throat> the, the issue that I pointed out to my brothers and sisters is the fact that what they're looking at in the way of an inheritance um, is a monetary uh, issue or with real estate where I look at the inheritance that uh, I had the privilege of taking care of my mom and dad and having <clears throat> my two kids grow up knowing who their grandparents were and uh, being able to have my daughter's child, my parents' uh, great-grandchild, and uh, being there for all the holidays and knowing full well that I extended their life and, and tried to uh, make the, the end of their life as, as comfortable as possible. Uh, because I hear horror stories of people being put into nursing homes and uh, you know being locked up, being isolated from any of their loved ones and, and this insanity has got to stop and uh, Bill I appreciate so much with what you're doing because you're the vehicle by which a lot of people can come out and finally say you know I'll speak up too and, and I think there's a big movement that's going on and trust me I know that what you're you're doing uh, puts your life in, in uh, danger at times because of the fact that uh, courts uh, and judges don't like to be challenged and uh, I believe there's a right way and a wrong way to do it but yet you know I have my rights to speak up and uh, I, I mentioned to you before just in passing that when uh, Pastor Terry Jones came into town and he was in Dearborn I went there because of the fact that I believed that everybody has a right to free speech and to be heard whether I agree with them or not. And uh, you know, people have to realize, like I said, not only is it their right, it's their obligation to speak up when they don't agree with what's going on. And in our government, they will continue to take our rights away from us, whether it's President Obama or any other president, we have to learn that, that we have an obligation as Americans to speak up and say, no, you're not going to take this away from me, or you're not going to take uh, you know, these rulings away from me, and that you have to protect me. Um, there was one issue that uh, I brought up, and I think it was uh, that I had uh, presented back in 1980. I had the opportunity to be on Ronald Reagan's security detail when he was running for president, and uh, I have a unique sense of humor, as do you, Bill, and uh, so did Ronald Reagan. And the guy was a class act, and we don't have leaders like that anymore. And uh, he said, well, son, you know, you've helped me out today, so if I'm fortunate enough to become president, what would you like me to do? And it took me about <clears throat> two seconds, and I said, I'd like for you to get the Berlin Wall tore down for my dad. And uh, he laughed. And then I explained to him that my dad had come from Germany and understood what it was like to be under the Hitler regime and lose all of your rights. And kids nowadays don't realize what it is to lose your rights. And they're slowly being taken away, no different than uh, a catfish being cooked in a pan that the, the heat is slowly brought up and then the heat continues to rise and they don't even realize that they're being cooked. And uh, eight or nine years later, I'm proud to announce that uh, Ronald Reagan kept his promise, had the State Department call my dad, and my dad got to go to Germany right near the uh, Brandenburg Gate, and uh, I've got video of it, that uh, he actually tore down part of the Berlin Wall and brought it back with him. And uh, that, that I think we as a nation have become so cold and apathetic that all we look about or all we care about is our own personal interest where we have a right and an obligation to help others as well 
and and uh, I think by what you're doing, that uh, you're you're bringing that back, and I'm, I'm very very proud to have met you, uh, and and uh, considered an honor for for what you're doing, uh, and and uh, it's it's a big sacrifice on your part. I mean, I think I mentioned it earlier too that you weren't aware of it, but uh, you said it's a 143 day uh, trip, and uh, a lot of people will put on their letters or whatever to their loved one that 143, which is I love you, and uh, this is a labor of love, and and uh, sitting there today in the uh, studio, watching some of the filming going on, but being able to share my story with the other people and. Having compassion, uh, I think, is the thing that we've lost as a nation. That uh, we just say, okay, we had 22 murders today in Los Angeles. Oh, well, you know, maybe tomorrow will be a better day. And, and we don't look to help other people. And, uh, you know, that, that I think is one of the strongest things that I got out of today is I was able to make, shoot, well over 20 some friends that uh, have their own set of issues. But yet we bonded in the fact that we understand, you know, that we're hurt, and uh, being able to uh, express our feelings, uh, I, I think many of us have to learn to temper the anger because that's just burning up energy. Uh, but to be able to tell our story so that maybe somewhere down the road we can help somebody else. Uh, but the biggest thing is to bring public awareness to the fraud and corruption that's going on. You know, we don't have as many bank robbers as what we used to do. You don't need to be a bank robber. You could sit there and rob from your own parents. Or a guardian could rob, you know, from somebody that they're supposed to protect. And uh, it's, it's a sad state of affairs when uh, we can no longer protect those that are most vulnerable, which is our children and, and the adults. And, uh, you know, uh, I met a girl named uh, Tammy and... Uh, I'm just uh, so proud of her for talking to a lady that she didn't even know outside of a courtroom and videotaped her and realized this lady's being taken advantage of. Um, and it, it, it gives me hope in America that there's still good people that are willing to uh, be able to try to help other people and realize that, uh, you know, there are a lot of injustices going wrong. And uh, when we say we want justice, uh, I, I believe the term would be that we want what is, you know, just as written what is in my mom's will or in my dad's trust. That, uh, you know, the, the courts want to believe they have the authority to just say, you know what, I don't agree with what your parents want, I'm going to toss it out, we're going to divide up the estate equally. And uh, the, they just have overstepped their boundaries, finding out that we have relationships with attorneys, that you, you, there are corrupt lawyers. And if they get elected into office, guess what? You got corrupt and, and unethical judges that come into play. And uh, for them to think that they're above the law, they're sadly mistaken. We have people like uh, David Chide that, that are willing to go to jail if necessary to be able to tell, you know, a judge that he doesn't agree with them. Or, you know, for God's sake, I believe he was a, a court watcher in a courtroom and because the judge didn't like what he had to say or had filed a lawsuit that they think they have the authority to throw him in jail. And uh, it, it's just wrong when we have these people that are in power abusing their powers. And uh, I've been to Washington, I've, I've met with uh, several senators, several Congress people, and uh, I, I have the ability and I think another issue if I could point out uh, that's wrong is that we as a nation have become a, a two-party country that, you know, you're either the Hatfields or the McCoys. You're either a Republican or a Democrat. Instead of looking at that individual that you're talking to as an American, uh, you know, I lean towards being conservative and, and being towards a Republican, but I voted for people that are Democrat if I believe in, in the issues that, that uh, you know, they could best represent me. Uh, I've got uh, Senator Carl Levin, who's the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, that uh, I walked arm in arm with him in the uh, St. Clair Shores Memorial Day Parade, and I had the opportunity to share with him with the um, case that was in Fort Leavenworth with the uh, 10 guys that are incarcerated as war criminals. So I mean, this, this whole issue of fraud and, and corruption 
uh, you know, is in the courtrooms, but it, it goes into our uh, elected officials in cities and states, into the uh, halls of Congress, uh, and unfortunately, even even you know, in the office of president, whether it's uh, President Obama or other presidents that have been there, uh, doing things that are for the best interest of the country, and uh, not going after the criminals and somehow criminalizing the victims. Uh, so many times uh, there, there's moms that their children are taken away from them. Uh, the, the issue of guardianship and, and elder abuse, like I said, is, is just grown rampant. And, uh, you know, in closing, I, I just thank Bill with what you're doing here. Uh, I can't thank you enough. Uh, and, and I look forward to at some point being able to hook up with you, hopefully out in Colorado. But uh, I'm going to be feeding information to other people that I know because I've established a network of about two, 3,000 people that, hey, where's Bill going to be? And, and we're generating interest. So if you can't possibly donate money, which a lot of people I would encourage them to do, but, uh, you know, provide some food. You know, bring in a snack. Uh, Bill is much like me. He's got a good appetite. But, uh, and you have to have a good sense of humor. And, and that's the one thing I found with a lot of the victims that you would think that they would sit off in a corner and, and have a pity party, but they don't. They actually want to take their <clears throat> tragedy, and whoever said big boys don't cry lied, okay? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm a big compassionate guy, and, and I don't have to carry a gun, okay? If I were to stand up, my size alone protects me, but, but uh, I, I'm willing to be able to talk to anybody and everybody that wants to listen and, and to say, you need to wake up to what's going on because uh, we as a nation are much like that catfish in that, in that uh, 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 container of water that, uh, you know, we're, we're getting cooked and we're not even realizing what's happening uh, as a nation and, and daily we're losing our rights.